OK, welcome, everyone, to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. My name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do is talk with webmasters and publishers, like the ones here in the Hangout and the ones that submitted questions, for example. Um, as always, if there's anything on your mind that you've been meaning to ask and you haven't had a chance to join these Hangouts before, feel free to jump on in now. Otherwise, we'll just continue with, <clears throat> with the submitted questions. I've, I've got a good, quick one, if possible. OK, go for it. Yeah, so just sort of um, around JavaScript, really. Um, sort of understand that Google's better its understanding of JavaScript in recent years. Um, and as part of that, does that mean that any objects that we uh, see being rendered in the code um, on the Search Console fetch tool? Um, does that mean that Google is seeing that and understanding that? Um, for example, like a JavaScript pub menu, for example. Um, we can, if, if it shows up in the rendered view, we can definitely see that. I, I think it would be a bit of a stretch to say we can always understand exactly what, what that is, uh, because sometimes there are things where we can't extract the text, for example. So if you have a canvas and you're writing something on there, for example, and all we see is the rendered view of this canvas with this essentially an image on it, then we might not be able to recognize that there's actually text there that we could pick up and index separately. But if, you, if it was in the, so you've got the rendered version and you've got the code version next to it, if it's in the code version that's being produced there, is it safe to say that actually you can see it and you can read it? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. one, one way to kind of double check that is to do a site query. So to search for your website and uh, maybe use some of the words that, that were in that text block. Just to kind of see, can Google actually extract those words or does Google have trouble even recognizing that, that those words are there? But for the most part, if it's in the HTML view, then we should be able to pick that up and show that in the cache view too. Perfect. Thank you. All right, um, let's get started. Uh, now that page rank has gone, um, how can we benchmark if a page is improving in Google's eyes and what we're doing is right? Please give us some tips. Um, so page rank has been gone for a while. Um, so it's not really something where I think you need to change the way that you think and focus on new tactics. Um, essentially, we've published for, I, I think, maybe five years ago, uh, a blog post on uh, other metrics that you could be focusing on instead of just page rank. So I try to look up that old blog post on, um, oh gosh, I forgot what the title was. Uh, but it's it's an old blog post uh, written by Susan Mosqua uh, about other metrics that you can use instead of just page rank. Will you guys just maybe update the blog for so-called old school SEOs that still believe in that? I mean, can you just maybe let people know it's gone, like, or maybe do a video? It's still gone. Well, this is a video. This is a video. So, yeah. page rank. Toolbar page rank is gone. You don't need to focus on that. Okay. Someone could cut that out and turn it into a separate video um, with my preaching hands. Uh, that might be kind of awkward. OK. Good. Maybe I should have thought about this more. But uh, th there are lots of things that you can focus on instead of page rank. Uh, one of the things that generally makes sense is to look at things like conversions, how people actually go to your website, what they do on your website. Are they able to actually buy something? Do they want to buy something on your website? Or are they confused by your website? So that's the kind of thing I, I'd recommend focusing on more. Um, whoops, the Q&A is showing errors. OK, here we go. Uh, if I want to link to an external source because I think it would be good for the user, is there any benefit in even having it? Should I do a nofollow? And if so, how will Google recognize the benefit of the link in my content if it doesn't follow it? 
So if you have a link in your content that you think makes sense for your users, I definitely include that. I mean, if it makes sense for your users, if it adds value to your pages, then by all means do that. If this is a natural link, so not something that is there because you have some kind of a relationship with the other website, then I definitely just use a normal, normal followed link. So nothing special, no need to block the flow of page rank there. Um, if it's a normal link, just use a normal link. Uh, we changed our URL structure and set up 301s, but left uh, some of our internal links from articles to categories, et cetera, as those will then 301 to the correct new URL. Are we losing any page rank from being passed on? These internal links or can it affect the SEO if they 301? Um, if you have a 301 set up for these URLs, then that's fine. There's no need to do anything crazy uh, for that. I, I think from a user point of view, having a lot of 301s might slow things down if you have a bunch of them after another. But uh, from from Google's point of view, from a search engine point of view, if you have less than a kind of an um, I think the limit is five redirects, then we can follow that all in one go, and we can forward all of those signals, and you should be fine. So I, I wouldn't necessarily worry about any of that. Um, if you have more than five redirects in a row, so if you click on one URL and it takes four or five step, five or six steps to kind of get to the final page, then that's something I look at to try to fix so that you don't have this, this kind of chain of redirects uh, for, for the links that people are clicking on, because it slows things down for users. And for Google, it means that we have to go in a second fetch round, essentially, to, to figure out where is this page actually linking to internally. Uh, we recovered from unnatural links penalty nearly two years ago. Our rankings have not recovered, even though we have vastly improved all aspects of our site. Uh, you said Google doesn't hold grudges. And could there be a trust issue of some sort, which time will fix? So what might be happening here is that part of the issues that your site was having is uh, maybe picked up by an algorithm that needs to be refreshed and needs to be rerun to kind of reflect that new state. Another thing that might be happening here, which is something that I've seen kind of happen with, with a lot of sites that used to be strongly supported by unnatural links, is that if you remove all of those unnatural links, if you kind of remove that unnatural support, then your website will be ranking differently, because those links are no longer there. They're no longer kind of um, helping your site either. So that's something where those two aspects might be coming along together and really focusing on the rest of your website and making sure that it's really doing everything right, that you're doing everything right with regards to links so that you're not going out buying links, uh, taking part in link schemes, those kind of things. I think that's something that where you'll see over time a kind of effect to, to kind of reverse that trend a little bit. But obviously, um, even if you were to kind of make everything go back to the state two years ago, a lot has changed on the web in those two years. So um, things will always be different. Um, how can you get to rank for more keywords on a page? Do you also take into account the internal content linked to the page or just the anchor text of the content linking to the page? Um, you. So we take into account pretty much all of that, uh, the content on the pages, the internal uh, kind of anchors on, the, on your website to figure out like what the context is between these individual pages, um, external anchors from links. We, we take that into account as well. So these are all things that kind of add up. But uh, one thing I would caution against is just saying more keywords is better than fewer keywords, because essentially, um, having a really strong site that works really well for even a handful of keywords where you're really kind of the authority in, in that niche is probably better for your site in the long run than to say, well, I'm kind of available for tons of other keywords. So instead of trying to spread out and cover as many keywords as possible in a kind of a mediocre way, I would really think about what you can do to focus your site, to focus your content, and really say that what you're providing on this topic is really the, the best kind of result that 
Google has available on the internet, and Google should be ranking this content at number one. Definitely, there's nothing else that even compares. So that's kind of what I'd aim for, rather than saying, well, I have a million keywords on my website. Uh, I can rank for a couple of words here or there. Uh, we have articles on our blog pages linked internally to relevant category pages. Uh, should we also be linking any related articles together as well? Would this help both the category pages and the article pages in terms of ranking for more keywords and SEO? Oh my gosh, another person who wants more keywords. Um, so kind of linking the content between, within your website I think always makes sense because it gives more context for us to kind of understand which of these pages belong together, how should this fit together, how should it work together. But it also helps users to kind of figure out what else they could be doing on your website that kind of matches what they're currently looking at. So instead of having to kind of navigate up through the menu tree and back down to a different branch, maybe they can jump over to from an article to a product, for example, and uh, look at that directly. So that's something where I definitely recommend finding a way to uh, provide some kind of an internal cross-linking that gives context to the content that you have um, so that people can kind of find their way around in, in different levels rather than just having to go through the menu tree all the time. Um, should we disallow links from websites with wildcard duplications like aaa.domain.com and ccc.domain.com? And uh, does many links from website without any traffic and backlinks, can that hurt our rankings? So I'm not 100% sure what, what you mean with uh, wildcard domains. Um, I, I have sometimes seen sites that are more kind of like directory sites where the, the subdomain is kind of a category and there are millions of sub, sub, subdomains there that kind of result in a, in a really complicated structure to set up. And if you feel that links from, from a site like that are causing you problems, or maybe you've bought links there in the past and you want them removed, then you can use a domain listing in the disavow file and just say everything from this domain. And that will automatically include all of the subdomains that are there as well. Uh, on the other hand, if you just want to disavow certain subdomains, then you can use a domain entry and say domain colon and the specific subdomain, and then we'll take that into account like that. John, can I ask a question? Sure. So I know we shouldn't care about keywords and URLs and so forth, but Google has said over time that the keywords in the URL do get looked at by the algorithms, and they might have a tiny little, tiny little itsy bitsy uh, back there in terms of rankings. Um, but you specifically called out saying that keyword rich TLDs, like dot attorney, for example, are are they not looked at at all? Do you say anything in the TLD is not, the keywords in the TLD have no impact at all? Is it something that you're excluding, or is it just the same as keywords in the URL? Um, as far as I understand, it's pretty much completely. So the, the TLD is not something that we take into account there. At all, OK. Thank you. Um, does this scenario still apply? Slap by an algorithm update, lost rankings, fixed, uh, fix applied, content improved, months passed, no rankings change, another algorithm update happens, and rankings are restored, improved. Um, yes, to, to some extent, that, that can happen like that. Um, it kind of depends on what, what kind of algorithm we're looking at. Some algorithms are more fast reacting than others. Other, some algorithms kind of uh, need to build up a history of information so that they can really trust that data. Uh, it really depends a lot on what specifically you're looking at there. How much uh, do you, like currently, regarding the algos, uh, like the rank brain, so how much do you trust it now because some time passed so far? Like, by the end of the year, will you trust it more, next year more and more? Soon it'll take over the world. Um, I, I don't know. It, it 
So, so to to a big extent, this really depends on what what happens with these algorithms and how the evaluations go over time. Um, so it's not so much a matter of us saying, "Oh, well, this has done a good job. We will give it kind of a few more points in the algorithm score." Um, it's more a matter of us saying, "Well, when we evaluate the quality and the relevance in the search results, um, does tweaking this style in one of these algorithms have a positive effect or a negative effect?" Oh, I see. So it's kind of like your assistant, basically, right now, for because it's it's not there's no human behind it. So I mean, you're just kind of yeah. use a particular. Okay, I see. No, okay. So so basically, we're just trying to evaluate based based on our quality evaluations. Does it make sense to change something here, or if we suspect that a change would make sense, if we say, well, Rank Brain should take over everything, which doesn't really make sense, but just just for for sake of, of having an example, uh, then we would come up with an hypothesis like that and say, well, it would lead to good research results if we did this specific change. And that's something that we would test. We would test that primarily internally to, to kind of see what, what is happening, what kind of URLs change, what kind of search results change. Does this make sense? And then we'd probably do an, a live test where we'd say, well, maybe I don't know, 1% of the users see this uh, change that we suspect will, will help improve, improve the quality. And we'll evaluate afterwards, was that a good change or was that a bad change? I see. OK. Thank you. And we, we do tons of these tests and evaluations all the time. So yeah, not because of rank brain now or because less, um, because before you used to do not as many. I mean, it just feels now that there's more being done. Like I'm seeing rich snippets all over the place like crazy. I I don't know if we're really doing more, but even in the past when we've done like a thousand changes a year, that's that's a lot. So depending on what you look at, there's kind of this I, I guess a bias almost of what you see when there are a thousand things happening a year. If you look at the specific things where a lot of the changes are happening, then you might notice more. Whereas if you look at a different part of the search results, you might say, well nothing has been changing for years. So there's a bit of a bias, I guess, there of what you're looking at. But um, we, we do make these changes all the time. And we, we try to be as objective as possible when we make these changes, where we say, we suspect this will lead to better search results, but we test it. So it's not the case that we say, oh, well, this uh, algorithm has been doing a good job in the past. We'll just uh, dial it up a little bit more, and I'm sure it'll work. We don't really have to try it. Out. So that's, that's not the case. John, since we're talking about updates, can I ask two questions? <laughs> All right. What, what is fast? So put your heads like this, and this is going to be like it's far away, and this is going to be it's pretty close. How far away are we for, to Penguin? I, I, I'm not going to put my hands up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I I know people are working on it, but I I don't want to make any predictions. Pretty. I've uh, learned that one. You know, it's sunny. Uh, no winter yet. So. Okay. Two is um, regarding Panda. So obviously we know Panda is running by itself. Slowly gets pushed out. It happens all the time now. So it just seems like I haven't seen people say, "Oh, my site that was hit by Panda has been released from and doing well now." Of course, it takes major efforts to be released from Panda. I've seen some sporadic reports, but is Panda still running, or it's something that's not really looked at at Google anymore? It's kind of like, you know, it should still be running. Yeah, it should still be. I mean, I I haven't seen like the the log files kind of slide through, but uh, this is something that's essentially running on its own now. So it's not not the case that you'd see any specific uh, updates from one day to the next, but uh, that the people who, who are affected by something like this, by a quality algorithm, they should see those changes over time kind of be reflected in the search results as well. Like over time to three months or like four months? Um, it, it really depends. So on, on the one hand, there's a factor of us having to kind of recrawl and reevaluate re a website. So that's something that can take a while. Uh, depending on the website, how much content that is, how often we crawl those pages, how often we index them, uh, that's something that, that could be 
kind of an, a factor with regards to, to the timing there. And the other part is really that the algorithms have to kind of trust that the data that they have now is actually uh, relevant, and that it's not just going to change again from the next day. So you can also kind of, tell all the cross stats. Like, if all of a sudden you have this huge spike, I mean, then that could be also, I guess. Um, we just get usually, uh, the crawling is a bit separated from the, the quality side, from the ranking side, in the sense that we see crawling and index more like a, a technical detail that we have to do ahead of time. Yeah. And the ranking is just based on kind of what we have indexed. So once it's, once it's indexed, we can figure out what to do with the ranking. Uh, but uh, the crawling side wouldn't necessarily change dramatically um, if one of the, the ranking algorithms were updated. Right. You said that before, that crawling doesn't really show me that an update's coming. You said that typically a spike in crawling means you switch to HTTPS or have major redirects, you do a domain name move, or there's some technical bug on the website. Yeah. But obviously, for the Panda score or any of these scores to be updated, you have to refresh. You have to go. You have to crawl, figure out what's changed, and so forth. But you won't do a spike in crawling if you see 10% of the site. You might do a spike in crawling if 10% of the site has updated. Yeah, I mean that that can happen, but it's not specific to to the Panda update in, in a case like that. So what what could happen is we notice. There's a bigger change on the website, and we think it would be helpful to kind of have this change reflected in our search results a bit faster. So we'll go off and crawl it a little bit faster. So that's that's like the the changes you mentioned, like HTTPS. That's that's an obvious one. Or if you move a domain, then that's something where we see a couple of URLs, and they're all redirecting to a new domain. We think, oh well. We can do this a little bit faster. We'll just double check more or double check them a little bit faster than we otherwise would to make sure that we can reflect this change in the search results a bit faster. John, just picking up on something you um, said, you said that Google wants to see that a site obviously isn't gonna ha hasn't been spamming in the past, then kind of fixes itself, then gets re-indexed, then recovers, and then immediately starts spamming again. So are you able to expand a little bit on that? Are you kind of saying that even after a site has been fully indexed or perhaps fully um, dealt with by the Panda algorithm, that it will still be saying, you know, we're still not going to let this site recover yet because it's done bad stuff in the past, and we need to see for some, some period of time. I mean, there was talk a while ago that Google would wanted to see a site for 18 months. I think that was kind of banded out somewhere or other. A site clean for 18 months before it sees a Panda recovery. Is that the kind of thing that you're talking about? I think 18 months seems a bit extreme. I, I suspect that, I don't know, someone mentioned that with regards to the sandbox back in the day. Yep. Um, but uh, we, we do want to kind of make sure that, that things can settle down before we take that into account. And sometimes the algorithms do want to see, well, this is kind of a stable state. So potentially there might be sites that when Panda 4.2 launched in what, July last year, there might have been sites that were clean at that point and even had been clean for a while. And perhaps Google's already looked at those sites, but if those sites had spammed particularly badly in the past, Google might be saying, you know what, we, we need to give this a bit of time to know that this site is going to be good for a long time before we start showing a recovery. Is that is that the kind of thing? Because I think there are some people that had sites that they thought were clean and had been clean for a while when Panda went live last year. And I think there's still kind of, there, there seems to be very little movement at all on the Panda site. So I think people are kind of wondering, is that because Panda hasn't looked at the site? Or is that because Panda has looked at the site and it's kind of wanting to wait a bit of time to see what's going on? I, I can see that being because of a manual action, but why would an algorithm care? It's so fast, it technically could be so fast that it doesn't really need to wait. When it's when it's running all the time, sure, yeah. Then that's something that can happen a little bit faster. But sometimes we do just want to make sure that things have settled down in a stable state. I, I don't know specifically with regards to the, the Panda sites that you mentioned there. So that's something where if you have example or have uh, links to old forum threads where, where that's kind of discussed, I, I'd love to take a look to see what, what has been happening there. Um, but in general, it's not the case that an algorithm would have to like wait a year for for things to settle down. Usually, it's more of a, a technical issue that we kind of need to wait until the data has stabilized. And is Panda the same Panda that we kind of all know and love? As in, when it was 
you know, last 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 year, I mean, we know that when we went real time, it went kind of sorry pseudo real time. It went part of the core algorithm, so it's kind of real time, and that Google needs to give it a little bit of a kind of manual kick every now and again. So the delivery method has changed, but is Panda itself looking for the same signals, the same quality stuff that it kind of looked for before, essentially, or has it kind of somehow fundamentally changed? Well, it hasn't fundamentally changed, but uh, I, I know the engineers work on these algorithms, so it's not something where, where I'd say nothing has ever changed there. Um, I, I know they, they try to like tweak things and make sure that we're actually bubbling up the right kind of high-quality content in the search results. So I, I wouldn't say nothing has changed, but at the same time, it's not that it's fundamentally different, and now it looks at... I don't know, instead of quality of the content, it looks at the color of your fonts or something like that. So that's that's not the kind of, kind of change that we would make there. So essentially the same, but there's obviously going to be upgrades and tweaks and things like that. Yeah. OK, thanks. So in, the, in the end of the day, there's no more animals coming, right? I don't know. Like, animals can always come. And I, I guess these were like... What, what, what can I say? Like uh, just names for specific algorithms. So we we do launch a lot of algorithms all the time, and I don't know. Maybe someone will name another algorithm after an animal, and uh, that gets made public like that. So I I can't promise that we won't have any algorithms called animals anymore. Okay. Yeah. All That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we try not to build up a big zoo and to make it too confusing. Okay, we'll ignore Gary's photos. Oh, yeah. He, he likes animal photos. I don't, I don't know what algorithm Gary is working on now. Um, how do you treat embedded video from YouTube in an article? Can you see the length of that video? Um, I don't know if we see the length of the video. And as far as I know, we don't use kind of like the, the textual content of, of that video for an embedded web page. Um, we do try to pick up things like titles and associate that with the video and try to use some of that for, for video search ranking as well. Um, but as far as I know, we don't use things like the comments on the YouTube video and try to embed those in the page itself. John, can I ask a follow-up to that? Sure. Could you... Um, we're having problems with our Wistia videos being indexed. And obviously we've written to Wistia, they say the code's all right. Um, and I posted something in the help forum as well. And the general consensus seems to be that Google might consider that because it had a YouTube video on there before and now it has a Wistia video, Google's essentially refusing to collect the new one and favoring the one that's still on YouTube even though it's not on the page but it still lives on YouTube and so it won't collect the new one which didn't seem to make sense to me but that's also what was in the both parties in the Webmaster Forum and in Wistia seemed to think might be the case that you had a video for it and don't need a new one but you guys removed rich snippets uh, em embeds, right? Like, it's no longer, like, you can't just embed Vimeo or anything, like, to your website. Like, it won't show. Oh, you can. No, no, that should work. I, I think there were some yeah. changes in the help center, which, which kind of confused people. But uh, we, we still support those. We, as, as far as I know, we should still be picking that up. So that's not something where we'd say, well... It was in this format before, therefore we'll never look at the new format again. Um, I do know things like videos and images in particular, they take a, a bit longer to kind of be reprocessed, just because in, in general they don't change that much. So that might be some part of, of what you're seeing there, but if it's, uh, like, say, the matter of months that you've had the new videos in there and they're not being indexed at all, then that sounds more like something technical, either with the way that you're embedding things or the way that we're picking them up on our side. Right, yeah, because both both Wistia and, well, not you, but say the technical side is fine. The sitemap picks up 54 videos but chooses to index one. 
Okay. We submit them via fetch, and we, you know, I've now taken the step with five of the videos as a test to make them private on YouTube. Just, you know, even though they haven't, we haven't been using those, just so those links just don't exist anymore if you tried to pick them up. Although, since you own that anyway, you could probably pick them up <laughs> if you wanted to. But I, don't, I really don't know what else to do after three or four months. Yeah. Um, one, one thing you can try is putting a video on a new page just to see if your suspicion has, has any merit, uh, because that'd be something we wouldn't know before. Um, the uh, What was I going to say? The other thing I'd make sure is that the, the way you embed the videos on the pages themselves is also correct, so that it's not just in a sitemap file, but it's also has like the, the right markup on the pages themselves. That's yeah, it passes something. all of the tests from, from both Webmaster Tools, you, Wistia, all of them. So okay. no one so, can see a technical problem there. All right. So I recommend putting it on a new page and maybe sending me your forum link so I can pass that on to the video folks here. OK. Do you want me to send that via Google Plus? That works, sure. OK. Um, can you give us any tips for diagnosing algorithmic penalties, not manual, Panda, or Penguin related, for websites without Search Console and analytics history data? Um, I think that would be pretty hard to try to figure out what is happening with a website without Search Console or Google Analytics data. That's yeah, I think that's it's possible, perhaps using third-party tools, but uh, that's really a great source of data that gives you a lot of insight into what has been happening with a website in the past. So, if at all possible, I'd really recommend looking into getting that set up so that you have Search Console and Analytics. It doesn't have to be Google Analytics. It can be any kind of website analytics data um, over a longer period of time so that you can kind of see what is changing within your website. Uh, we use a third-party site for our service reviews and have a widget on our site showing which links uh, these which links to the third-party site, how best should we display these reviews so that we get the SEO benefit from having them, or should we just display some content? Um, so in general, since we can crawl and index uh, JavaScript content, if you have a JavaScript widget that pulls in a few of these reviews, and that's something that we should be able to pick up and keep uh, in the search results. So one thing you could do to kind of double check that this is happening is to do a site query for your website and include some of the words from those reviews and just see if some of that content actually shows up in the search results. If it does show up in the search results, then you're essentially all set, and you kind of have that set up in a way that some of those reviews are visible in search as well. And uh, there's any different from ranking point of view if we give paginated pages without the first one, no index. Oof. Um, let's see. Uh, if we have paginated pages with no index, follow instructions. Uh, rel next, previous, and canonical are set. Um, so if you have paginated pages and you know index everything but the first page, we will not be able to index anything but the first page. So if the first page has all of the content that you want to have indexed, then that's, that's fine. If there's content on the other pages that you do want to have indexed, then you probably need to make those indexed instead. You're also not going to see the canonical and other tags, are you, if they're not indexed? Um, we'll probably see the canonical tags, but it's always a bit confusing if you say these pages are equivalent, but at the same time you say one page is indexable and the other page is not indexable. So they're, either they're equivalent or they're not equivalent. Uh, what we'd probably do there is just say, well, these pages are no index, so we'll drop those. Um, our blog articles are structured site.com slash blog dash article dash title, but we've heard um, 
been told to change them all so they're lower down the URL structure. So site.com slash DIY slash floor guide slash blog article title as PageRank will flow better. Is the current setup hampering our SEO? Uh, no. The current setup is perfectly fine. You don't need to create any kind of artificial URL structure with folders uh, for that to be indexed in Google. You won't have any ranking advantage of using either one of these setups. So I try to pick one that works for you and try to keep that for the long run. Because anytime you make changes there, that's something where we'll have to essentially reevaluate the site, all of the content that was changed there to figure out what is the relationship between these URLs and the rest of your website. So that's something where any kind of a change you make there will probably have kind of at least for for medium period of time, fluctuations in rankings in search, uh, just because we have to figure out these are all completely new URLs and internal linking is completely different, and how all of that should belong together. So if you want to make a change in in that URL structure, I just work to make sure that you find something that works for the long run, where you don't say, well. Next month, actually, I wanted to put the category first and then the subcategory second instead of the way I have it here. Uh, so find something that works for the long run. Um, our mobile responsive site was used as an example on the SMB site clinic uh, as one which was easy to use. We use a drop-down menu navigation to go through each section on the site, but the text is hidden until you select the drop-down to view. Is this text discounted? Uh, yes, probably. So I don't remember which site it was, um, but probably what is happening is we'll discount that text uh, because it's not visible by default. In practice, that probably doesn't matter because that's a part of your, your menu structure. That's something you have across all of your pages anyway. So that's probably not the, the primary content of these pages, not the primary text you want to rank for. So. In practice, I think that's probably perfectly fine, the way you have it like that, um, as long as the primary content really is visible. Are you planning on doing any more SMB site clinics? Uh, if so, can we do these on a regular basis? Um, Possibly. I, I think doing these is really interesting, on the one hand, for me, because I see a lot of the, the issues that we might have missed otherwise. Um, on the other hand, also hopefully for the people who were in these Hangouts, uh, the difficult part is, of course, they take a lot of time to prepare, uh, because uh, there are a lot of websites out there that, that have questions about the, their website, and trying to distill the individual issues into something that's generally useful for, for all kinds of webmasters is sometimes a bit tricky. Uh, one thing I'd recommend doing is maybe posting in the help forums and getting advice from other webmaster peers who have a lot of practice as well to kind of um, get some input, at least, on your website and on things that you could be focusing on. And as always, if you post in the help forums, if you post anywhere publicly, kind of try to figure out which advice you really need, want to listen to, because uh, sometimes you get advice on things that are obviously useful to do, but might not be the primary problem for your website. Uh, now that Panda is a part of the core algorithm, uh, is that correct? Yes. Uh, so is there any possibility to, to recover from this uh, if I got hit in July 2015? Yes, since this updates regularly, this will kind of take into account the new changes that you've made across your website. Uh, we're doing a new home page design and adding some deep links to products, but reducing some links elsewhere as these pages can be accessed via navigation. Uh, what's the best practice? As we don't want to screw up our rankings or page rank, um, I don't know if there's a general best practice guide. What, one thing I'd recommend doing, just from a practical point of view, 
is running this by your users and doing maybe an A-B test, um, maybe even inviting some users to, to your office directly or to uh, kind of a video chat to discuss uh, the changes that you've made there so that you get their feedback. In general, if you're just tweaking the internal links slightly, that's not something where you'd see a big effect in the search results. Uh, sometimes, of course, if you change them dramatically, then that's something that you might see as being visible in the search results. So for example, if you move one category from being kind of like a sub, sub, sub category to something that's linked from the home page, then suddenly that looks to search engines as something that's a lot more important that we could potentially give more weight as well. So that's something where, to some extent, you might see changes in search depending on what you make. But uh, the, the general guidance I'd give there is really to listen to your users and figure out what they think is important and to make sure that you're reflecting that within your website, because ultimately that's what we'll try to reflect in search as well. Uh, what metric does Google autocomplete use in the search results? Should we be looking at this more? Does it give an indication of what Google thinks our site thinks of our site against the search terms? If not, what is it telling us from an SEO point of view? It's probably not telling you anything from an SEO point of view, because this is more of a user-facing feature that tries to make it easier for users uh, when, when they search. And it's not meant to be a webmaster-facing feature that gives you SEO advice. So that's something where I wouldn't necessarily worry too much about. Uh, we share our original news content with another publisher. Uh, we submit news to their website where they host it to and they share it socially. Are we risking duplication, even if it appeared on our site first? Uh, no access to their head to canonical this. Um, obviously, if you're sharing content, then that's duplicate content. It's like the same content on both of these websites. And what can happen is that we uh, rank the other website first for some of that content. So that's something that's, that's always a possibility. If you don't want that to happen at all, the best way to do that is not to share your content. So that's something where I think as, as a website, as a business, you kind of have to uh, look at those, those options. On the one hand, sharing your content, maybe reaching a bigger audience. On the other hand, ranking for your own content, uh, making sure that your website is shown first for that content. And that's something that um, you kind of have to figure out on your own and think about where does it make sense to get a broader audience to this type of content, and where does it make sense to make sure that our name is the primary one associated with this content. Uh, what determines whether a page gets review stars in the search results? We get a lot of traffic and put valid small business structured metadata for a review a month ago. Uh, some of our pages have stars, but no new stars are showing up yet. Um, that sounds like something that's probably not easily answerable uh, in a Hangout like this. So I'd recommend posting in the Webmaster Help Forum, including the URLs and the queries that you're looking at. Uh, so that someone can kind of take a look and see what the difference is between the pages that do show stars and the pages that don't show stars on your side. Uh, sometimes there are technical differences with the markup. Sometimes it's from a quality point of view more where you say, well, actually those reviews don't belong on those pages like that. Uh, any plans to revive Google's search preview tool for rich snippets, uh, which is now available only for rich cards? Um, maybe. Um, this is something we, we've always been trying to look at uh, to make it easier for people to understand what the effect of markup on their pages is. So I could imagine that maybe we come back with, with some kind of a preview tool uh, that shows a little bit more different types of markup as well. I believe for app indexing, there's something similar as well, linked from the uh, developer site. Uh, so this is something where your feedback is really helpful for us to figure out which parts we could be focusing on more. So I'll take that as one vote for adding another preview tool.
Uh, we keep getting image links from poor quality foreign sites, which we're constantly adding to disavow. Is there any harm in blocking those countries' IP addresses as we don't do any business there, so there's no reason for them to ever reference us? Um, that seems kind of harsh. As, as someone not living in the US, I, I feel like you might be blocking users in Switzerland. That wouldn't be really nice. Um, in general, the thing to kind of keep in mind here is um, if you're blocking users, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're blocking those sites from linking to your content. So just uh, by kind of blocking access uh, to your site for users in specific countries doesn't necessarily mean that those links from those websites there will also kind of uh, disappear in the search results. So they could be completely different things. On the other hand, it could also be that the server that's kind of creating these links to your website is actually hosted there, and that server goes off and looks at your website to see which content it could be linking to. Uh, so in those cases, maybe blocking those IP addresses would make sense. Uh, but in general, I wouldn't go so far as to say all users that are outside of my core target audience should be blocked by IP address. Because then you sometimes run into the situation that you're accidentally blocking someone who's traveling, or that you're accidentally blocking a search engine uh, just because you think, well, nobody in that country could be buying something from me. But somehow, the search engine crawler IP address maps to that country. So that's so, something I, I'd be kind of cautious on, about. Sometimes it makes sense to do this. Sometimes it's, it's a bit too much. Does that affect ranking? If you're blocking users from certain countries, um, not, not directly. I mean, as long as Googlebot can access that content for indexing, for crawling and indexing, we can pick that up and show that. Um, but you might be seeing a kind of an indirect effect in that if you're blocking all users from the UK from accessing your content, then obviously those users in the UK won't be able to recommend your content because they, they can't look at it. Yeah. Uh, we've implemented site-wide lazy load for images and click to expand for long text. Then after one month, we lost 70% traffic from Google Search. Uh, is it a coincidence, or did our website trigger a filter because of this? Can you check? Um, so I wasn't able to check just yet, but you can check on your site as well. So you can look at the queries that, that you're seeing for your website, the queries that you saw before, and kind of judge to see um, were the queries for content that maybe you have in the click to expand section? Or were the queries for images in image search where you say, well, suddenly these images might not be showing up in image search, and we're losing that traffic? So that's something you can kind of check on your side as well. It's not always trivial, but especially when you have kind of a clear change date, that's something where you can try to drill down in the tools that you have available in Search Console and Analytics or whatever you have that you're using to figure out what is different from before to now. And of course, make sure that you're looking at a time range which is relevant, where you have enough data, and also where the data isn't skewed. So don't look at a, a weekend in, in the before view and during the week afterwards, because for a lot of sites, the traffic patterns during the week and on the weekend are very different. So that's something where you could kind of dig into that on your side as well and say, well, actually, yes, all of the queries that we lost are for con is for content that we now have in Clicks to Expand. Therefore, I need to make sure that maybe my Click to Expand content is visible by default, or maybe I'll need to rethink my strategy on which content to show with the, the click to expand and which ones to kind of show by default. Um, if a site is talking about lots of things that are irrelevant to a site's primary focus but of interest to the visitors, is it likely to dilute the strength of the relevance as an authority overall? Um, we see quite a lot, bit of this in the wild. Um, from Google's point of view, I don't think that's that's that much of a problem. Um, but uh, just from kind of a website point of view, I think that's something where it probably makes sense to kind of focus your energies on, on the right kind of topic or on the right kind of users 
where you say you're not providing something that's completely irrelevant. So if you're selling shoes and you have a lot of, um, I don't know, you have a lot of photographs of beaches and people always come to your website for those beach photos, they're probably not going to kind of skip over and start buying shoes suddenly because they like your beach photos. So if you have something that's kind of overlapping where the audience is kind of the same, I think that kind of makes sense. But if it's re really a completely different audience and the target of your website is to sell shoes, then maybe you can think about ways that you can kind of focus that a little bit more. And I think that's more of a kind of a business and a marketing decision than, than an SEO decision. Uh, from, from an SEO point of view, we can look at these pages individually and say, well, this is a nice beach photo page. We'll rank this one for beach photos. And this is a nice shoe, shoe store. I'll rank it for shoe stores. We can generally kind of separate those, those two things. Um, all right. We, let me just run through some of the questions here to see uh, if there's anything else kind of unique here. Um, uh, da -da -da -da. So much stuff. Wow. Good thing we have a bunch of Hangouts planned this week. Um, so I think tomorrow we have a Hangout on AMP, where if you're setting up uh, AMP content on your site, if you have especially more advanced questions around AMP, we have one of the engineers who help to kind of deploy this uh, and joining us there. Uh, that'd be really useful. Um, I'm joining a Hangout with, with another site on duplicate content with uh, someone from the web spam team. Uh, on Thursday, I think. Also, the German Hangout is on Thursday, and on Friday we have another one. So if we can't get to all of your questions here, uh, we feel free to kind of copy and paste those questions over. Um, Are those public Hangouts, or just uh, I think they're all public Hangouts, yeah. Where so are they listed? On the Google Webmasters page. Also, if you go to google.com slash webmasters, I think there's an events link you can click on uh, where all of these Hangouts should be listed as well. OK, I need to make sure they don't clash with the football. Oh, man, yeah. I totally forgot about that. It'll be totally empty if not everyone's watching football. All oh, the bounce rates will be huge. The bounce rates, oh, god. That was just. OK. I, I'll have to remember that one. Before you go, do you want to raise your hands, or you don't want to? <laughs> all right. Uh, we, we have a couple minutes left for questions. Maybe I'll just open it up for questions from you all. Is it important to have uh, like social signals today on a website if, uh, if the owner says, hey, you know, I don't need that stuff because it's you know, not relevant for my business? Like, uh, would you guys really? Would you guys favor the one, the site above him, that has the signals on Twitter and so on? As Google far files. as I know, we don't use social signals at all for ranking. You know, you've said that many, many times. No. But I mean, so it's not really important. If he doesn't want to have it, then. I, I'd say from a search point of view, it's probably not important. I think from, from a general website, kind of marketing business point of view, sometimes it does make sense. Yeah. If, if your audience is out there on a social network and you can reach them by being active on a social network, then that's obviously traffic you can drive to your site that you wouldn't have otherwise. So that's something where I wouldn't say, well, Google doesn't use it for search, therefore nobody should use Instagram or any of these other social networks. You kind of have to work out what, what works for your site. But eventually it will become a ranking factor, or you don't think so? Eventually, I don't know, lots, lots of things can eventually happen. The sun will kind of explode and take over everything. It's, I, I don't know. I, it's possible, maybe, maybe not. Um, it's, it's one of those things where, like, like I mentioned in the beginning, if we recognize that this does bring value in our, into our search results, then maybe we will kind of reevaluate what we've been doing so far. I think that one of the important things about the internet in general is that 
you have your website. You can change your website from one day to the next. And uh, that's something you could, should try to take advantage of. So instead of saying, well, we've decided to do this, therefore we'll do this for the next 10 years, maybe say, well, things have changed, and we should change our mind and change our focus a little bit based on that change. And that could happen next week. That could happen next year. That could happen in 10 years. Uh, you kind of have to be open to change on the internet and kind of flow with what happens outside. Yeah, OK, thanks. John, given that you've said we're talking about stuff changing, can I just check something with you? Something I think you said a couple of years ago, but just to see if it's still the case, which is that in Search Console, when you look at your inbound links, you'll often see a number of pages in there that link to you that aren't actually in the search index. I don't know why that is, and maybe some content is cached or stale or whatever. But I think you've said in the past that if a page isn't in the search index, then even if it's in Search Console, it won't contrib contribute to um, any kind of algorithmic penalty filter, anything like that. Is that still the case? Um, we, we should have these pages in our index if they're listed as links in Search Console. So that would uh, you don't that want to go there. really confusing. Um, I, I mean, w one aspect that could be happening there is that a page maybe has a no index on it, and uh, we know about it. We can crawl it. We can p kind of pass page rank through the links that are there, but it's not indexed because it has a no index on it. Or maybe it's uh, kind of uh, temporarily hidden with a URL removal tool, something like that. Or maybe it was hacked and is hidden from the search results because of that. But in general, if it's listed as a link in Search Console, we should know about that URL. Just to be clear, we're talking about the page that does the linking, not the page that's being linked to, yes? So Search Console yeah. will link the, But I mean, yeah. this, we and lots of people will see a large number of, often a large number of pages in Search Console. And if you sort of go to Google, you search specifically for the URL, it's not there. And even if you try and find it in any way, you, you type something that's on the page, it just doesn't come up at all. That's, I think that's not an uncommon thing to happen. And I, 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 maybe I'm getting confused here, but we see that quite a lot, and I think quite a lot of people see that quite a lot. Page and search console that don't seem to be in the index. Um, Should I send you some that examples? Would be, yes, send me some examples. That, I mean, now you're confusing me. Uh, <laughs> that, that shouldn't be that the case. I mean, some, sometimes what happens is uh, it takes a while for us to update that data in Search Console. But okay. if it hasn't been indexed for a while, then we should be dropping that. It shouldn't uh, kind of remain cached in Search Console and disappear from the index. Um, usually, that should be kind of in sync. OK, but, I'll send you examples. OK, great. Cool. All right, uh, we, we've kind of run out of time here. Um, thank you all for your questions so far. And like I mentioned, we have a bunch of Hangouts more that are ready to happen for the rest of this week. Um, and maybe I'll see you, or some of you, then as well. And uh, I'll also be setting up the new Hangouts one, once we've got this week passed so that you can line up and uh, get the next Tuesday set up as well. I'll try to make it Friday morning, 5 a.m. You're crazy. <laughs> OK, it's good to have crazy people here. <laughs> All right. Thank you again, and have a good evening or afternoon or day, depending on your time zone. Bye. Bye. Thanks.